It is amazing to stand here on this red dot. A round symbol, a red carpet, and a global symbol of TED Talks. When TED started in 1984, stages were very informal. Sometimes speakers stood at tables or podiums and read their scripts. Over time, stages evolved to beautiful displays of technology and art, all with a red round dot. It is a universal symbol for ideas worth spreading. And whether there are hundreds of them stored all over the world, or just one, perhaps flying first class, these symbols add value to place. Our lives are full of symbols, of things that add value to place. Some are useful, others are beautiful, and over time they evolve to have meaning. Recent trends encourage us to be minimalists, to keep only those things in our lives that bring us joy, and to store everything in colorful, magazine-worthy systems. These trends are trying to help us, but they can be challenging, somewhat limiting, and stressful. We need to change how we value and organize our belongings and consider how they support our lives rather how, than how they define or influence it. As a systems architect, I'm trained to understand data and the value of it as it comes together to form information. Place and time are critical components to the success of a system. Think of place as where data is stored and how it's stored, and think of time as when it's retrieved. I pursued a master's in architecture because I wanted to better understand the built environment and how it's influenced by place and time. Think of a home that has living spaces, eating spaces, and sleeping spaces, or an office that has working spaces and meeting and social spaces. Rarely do we think of storage spaces. As architects, our programs usually list these main areas that we work in or that we live in. But those storage spaces are where we typically start when we think about organization. I'd like to share with you an alternative. Four steps to understanding what we have and how we organize our belongings. And as the line blurs between home and work and we find ourselves sharing spaces in new ways, we can apply these steps to our working environments as well. Businesses have value statements. These statements guide decisions and identify what makes them successful. Homes should as well. Homes should have value statements that guide the decisions that we make in our homes and make us successful. In order to create a value statement for your home, start by identifying what is useful, what has purpose, and what supports how you live in your home. Here's an, a photograph of the university. Here's the university during a snowstorm, a university snowblower, and my snowblower. It is old, it is not very pretty, but it is useful. It sits in a corner of the garage and it swaps locations seasonally with a lawnmower. If I were to judge either one of them by aesthetics or by how often I use them, they would each fail that test. But if I judge them by usefulness, in this case, safety and quality of life, they're very useful. So let's start our value statements by identifying what is useful. One way to identify what is useful in your home is to look around. Look at the sorts of things that you use on a regular basis. Another idea is to consider what would be an ideal list. For example, in a kitchen, what is the ideal combination of pots, pans, plates, and dishes for you to live? Or in a garage, what is that core set of tools you would need to support a home and perhaps uh, an automobile? One way to test whether something is useful is to think about whether you put it on a list and went out and specifically purchased it. Next, write down what's beautiful. Think of the art and artifacts that are in your home, the things that tell your story. William Morris once said, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. When identifying what is beautiful in your home, look around. These are the things that are on display. Next, the elements that we need to consider. When I was doing research on this topic, I found a couple interesting statistics on clutter. According to OfferUp, 
Nearly half the homes in America have items that they consider clutter and that they no longer use. At UCLA, researchers looked at the relationships between uh, high density of items in the homes and they found a link between the high density of items in the homes and high cortisol, the stress hormone. And the Center for Disease Control found that 80% of our medical expenses are related to stress. Our clutter is contributing to our stress. Yet sometimes it's hard to identify what is clutter. After all, we purchase most of the items in our home. And at one point, we did think that they were valuable decisions. It is daunting to think of going through a house, taking everything out of a particular closet or a drawer, identifying what you want to keep, what you don't want to keep, disposing those items that you don't want, and then organizing those items and returning them back to those drawers or closets. So go through your home first with your value statement. Look around at the things that you have considered both useful and beautiful. Identify the things that you want to keep and dispose of the things that you don't want to keep. Gifts are a unique situation as somebody else decided that they hold value for us. And while they might not cost us money, they do cost us time and space. So quietly consider if those match your values. Items that are in storage are an interesting situation because we can't see them. They generally fall in two categories. They are either seasonal or sentimental. Those items that are used within a year are seasonal. They make sense to keep. Those items that are not used within a year are likely sentimental. And at that point, we might be saving them for somebody else. Organization begins after we've identified our values, after we've written down what is useful and what is beautiful to us in our homes. Organization is the act of storing things, and we're storing them for retrieval. Good organization is all about retrieval. It is storing items so that we can easily retrieve them to use them in our daily lives. A couple examples. Think of a kitchen. Plates, glasses, flatware ought to be conveniently located between the dishwasher or the sink and the table so that they're in between both and easy to access. That one drawer that many of us have in our kitchen, if it is a mound of things and difficult to dig through, it's not particularly well organized. But if it has just a couple items, perhaps pen and paper, uh, batteries, a flashlight, it's well organized because these are things that we use often. We have easy access to them. And it wouldn't make sense to store each one of those items separately throughout the home. I'm a runner. I value time on the road. And at one point, my running gear, pants, tops, socks, and hoodies were all hung up or folded and stored in, in different parts of the room. It would take 10 minutes to get ready, and sometimes it was an excuse not to go. I changed my priorities. I factored in time, and I took my everyday running gear, and I put it in a basket. When the basket's empty, do laundry, throw everything back in the basket. It's not particularly elegant, but it's a really valuable use of my time. Several years ago, I shared these ideas with my children. I gave them each new hangers, containers, and shelves, and asked them to write value statements for their rooms. About a week later, I checked in. One child had their clothing beautifully hung up, sorted and organized by color, by style, and by season. School supplies were sorted by course in the containers, perfectly aligned on the shelves and everything else was very well organized in the room. The second child had a pile of clean clothing on the floor, a pile of dirty, a pile of donations, and a pile of school supplies and books and games and pretty much everything else. And those hangers and those containers, they had given to the first child. They each chose a system that worked really well for them. There are hundreds of systems out there today. When looking at the systems for your home, consider several things. The time it takes to set it up, to store, retrieve, and to maintain the system. Choose the ones that are best for you. And remember, the more complicated the system, the longer it's going to take to maintain. Beautiful items should be on display. Our enjoyment comes from viewing them, from the aesthetics. Large collections can be a challenge, as sometimes they're both useful and beautiful. Consider books. Cookbooks go in the kitchen, 
Art books go on tables, reference books can go in a bookcase or in our working spaces, and others can go in storage for future reference. What remains then are items for another time or another person. Seasonal items that are used within a year make sense to store in an attic, a basement, or a garage. Those items that are not used within the year are likely sentimental. And at that point, we're saving them for somebody else. Think of the grandparent, and perhaps there's jewelry that we're handing down from a grandparent to a child. Those do items don't need quick retrieval. They can easily be stored, tucked away for future use. This is a great opportunity as well to share our value statements with friends and family and see if there's synergies between the items that they are also saving that are sentimental. We can apply these steps to our working environments as well. Though when I work with my clients, I find that the opposite approach is often more successful. Start with what's beautiful. Identify those things that bring enjoyment to you. Consider trophies for big wins. Photographs with clients for a successful product launch or mementos that are timeless. Then work backwards. Identify what is useful what got you to these wins? Think of the materials, supplies, and resources that supported you for these big wins. At the beginning of the pandemic, I cleared my office and I brought everything home. Uh, certain that my team might need them and I was gonna be there for them. I hadn't thought about the impact to my house at the time. My team only needed about 20% of what I brought home. Had I gone through this exercise at the time, I would have brought home less. And as we are now all moving towards a seamless workplace, it's even more important to identify what is useful, where we need it, and when we need it. We need to revisit our value statements periodically as our lives change and the things that we value change as well. A year ago this week, I was closing on our family home of 40 years. I was moving all of those items up to Colorado. My mother had passed the year prior, and my father was now in assisted living. At the time, I didn't think at all about the items, just moving them back to Colorado. Dad passed Thanksgiving. These items now are all beautiful, they hold meaning, and they're insight into who my parents were. We need to change how we value and organize our belongings and consider how they support our lives rather than how they define or influence it. Let's reframe organization not as a stressful event, but as an ongoing exercise to surround ourselves with the belongings that matter. Thank you.